Um, thank you for having me here. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, uh, satellite interference because I think stopping satellite interference, or at least mitigating it, is a good way to uh, reduce, uh, to get better efficiency out of a, a limited resource that we all depend on, or many of us depend on, especially broadcasters, uh, for sending content uh, around the world and for acquiring content. Um, I've worked very closely over the years with a, a number of different groups, uh, uh, also nonprofit, uh, different nonprofit groups to uh, to try to do what we can about uh, interference. Uh, mostly the GVF, the Global VSAT Forum. Um, uh, in uh, February of 2011, uh, Rich Wolf, the guy who uh, didn't want to show up today. Um, and I uh, got together because we were, we were kind of challenged by Intelsat at, a, at a, a customer's conference, actually sort of one of these kinds of things only for their business. And uh, we kept complaining about satellite interference and they said, well, what are you doing about it? And we said, no, 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 you're the operator, you, you've got to fix it. And uh, they said, well, well, yeah, but we're trying, what are you doing? So why don't you do something? So uh, eventually, Rich and I got together with other broadcasters. Uh, we held a meeting at ABC in New York in 19, in February of, uh, of 2011, and there were about 45 uh, people there from the satellite companies, from uh, SNG operators, uh, broadcasters, all the broadcasters in the US, plus Canada and Mexico. And uh, we talked about some things we could do uh, we, we went through the problem, everybody, I mean, the, the satellite operators kind of admitted that uh, interference costs them a lot of money. So in the long run, that also cost us a lot of money because we're the, the customers. <clears throat> it was kind of one of those buried, nobody talked about kind of uh, things because it was just like the cost of doing business. Anyway, um, we set up, uh, we, we worked with uh, GVF, we worked with uh, the Satellite Interference Reduction Group, uh, which used to be a, a group called SURG. I hated that name. I, I used to call it SURGE because at least it had some, you know. But, but they've, they've actually now changed it to SIRG, and I think they want to drop the S. They just want to be the Interference Reduction Group. And uh, another group I've worked with since 1985, which is the World Broadcasting Union's Interference, Sa I I International Satellite Operations Group. Uh, S uh, ISOC has a, a working group called um, the RCWG. What's that? That's the Rogue Carrier Working Group. We, we started working on interference in 2000, uh, 1999 or 2000, and basically, uh, the feeling was that it was the pirates, these guys who were stealing content and bandwidth, they were the problem. Well, that's not true. They're only about half a percent or so, maybe one percent of the problem. Uh, the rest of it is inadvertent interference, uh, either by bad equipment or, or people making mistakes, uh, or um, uh, people just not knowing what they're doing. and. Uh, and that seemed to be an area that 98%, 8.5, whatever it was, that we could maybe work on and do something about. So the, uh, we started this group called RFI-EUI, the Rogue Carry Ro Radio Frequency Interference End Users Initiative. Um, and uh, we started three working groups, one for carrier ID or CID. Um, that's presently chaired by uh, a guy named George Milton, who's director of teleport engineering at, at CNN and Turner. Um, <clears throat> uh, another group was the best practices documentation and technology working group, which is chaired by a guy named Paul Cohn from uh, uh, VP of engineering, satellite engineering at Fox. Um, and uh, the training and certification working group, which is chaired by uh, Maura Maloney is the Senior Director of Transmission and uh, Access uh, Control for ESPN. These are really uh, people who actually really didn't want to do these jobs um, at first, but they've, they've coalesced and they've come along and they're now working at these uh, tasks pretty effectively. Um, have you, did you change me? Thank you. I'm, I'm changing you. Yeah. 
that essentially we've established uh, some of the achievements that have taken place. Is the first thing is about six months, eight months after we got started, we set up a website. Please go to the website, take a look at uh, uh, www.rfi-eui.org. Uh, it'll tell you what our objective is, what we're trying to do. Uh, it, it's kind of a North American thing right now. We'd like to make it global. We really think that for uh, the mi uh, real mitigation of interference, we've got to be a global operation, and we've got to have broadcasters and other uh, media and content users uh, involved on a global basis in order to, to be successful. Um, the first uh, bit of success that we had was the adoption by Utilsat, Intelsat, and SES of uh, requiring this network information table, inclusion of a carrier ID signal for all those transmissions going on satellite out of the Olympics. And uh, they all pretty much worked with their customers uh, those three, is there anybody here from Intelsat or SES or Utilsat? Okay, so I can say anything really. <laughs> um, <laughs> they only came for the dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> but basically they, they uh, worked with their customers that, and, and I'd have to check back to make sure it happened, but as far as I know, anybody up on satellite had a carrier ID signal in the network information table that was readable by the operator uh, at, a, at their downlink end, and uh, that was a first step. Uh, on top of that, um, the DVB forum since last spring has been looking at an, a digital carrier ID standard. Uh, it went through the commercial uh, forum uh, area of the forum, and it's been in the hands now of the technology group at uh, the DVB forum, and uh, we hope by the end of uh, end of the year. Although actually, I'm hoping by the end by the end of October is what we're told, there should be a, a CID standard for inclusion in modulators. And uh, if, if and when that happens, we'll begin to be able to standardize and, and add that uh, into a list of carrier ID s information. Mostly it's like the MAC address. And uh, that will lead you to uh, a list uh, that's held by the operators and um, we hope also, there's another group that's out there called the SDA, the Satellite uh, Data Association. Anybody familiar with that? Uh, this is the operators. Right now it's like 19 of the satellite operators, about 60% of the satellite company, satellites in the, wor in the world, um, who are working together to uh, share ephemeris data about uh, what's happening with satellites, where they are, um, what's happening to them. It's like uh, Intelsat 9 uh, the other day um, when it lost uh, contact. But, but also where exactly the satellites are and uh, it's better and more uh, exact information than has existed before and uh, we're hoping it's at some point that on a, uh, an area of their uh, database, they will include the, the list of uh, carrier ID num uh, numbering. Uh, we've worked to um, establish through the best practices group uh, something called the UAP or the Universal Access Procedures. Uh, this was something that was done actually through ISOG and CERG uh, back in 2004, adopted by the ITU in 2006, but we felt it was needing an update and the best practices group took that on and it's now uh, going to be resubmitted as a, as a, as a uh, procedures uh, uh, to the ITU through the U.S. Working Party uh, when they go back to their uh, Geneva meetings in September. And we think that should be of help. Uh, evidently a lot of people around the world think anything out of the ITU is really that that's it. So. If we can get that approved, that'll be a, a help in that direction. Um, we're trying to develop uh, minimum training requirements for those people who are operating or stations of any kind. Um, that's been broken into a number of different categories uh, and sent around right now to different, different areas, different companies that, that actually do training, uh, such as uh, Sid Shea's group in Washington and uh, Jonathan Higgins' uh, operation out of the, the United Kingdom and 
again, the whole idea is let's make this global and get agreement on what's needed to be properly trained to operate uh, uh, RF equipment. Um, we're trying to coordinate uh, uh, with other academic institutions that if there's schools that teach RF uh, uh, techniques and, and training. Um, and uh, we hope at some point that SDA will hold uh, a database of, uh, the, the end result of the training and certification group is to have anybody who's pushing a button um, to send RF up in the sky to have them certified and have them get a, something, you know, right now the only thing you need it to, to be certified as a uh, uplink operator is a driver's license. Uh, we think you should have more than that and that uh, that's one of the goals. Uh, we don't think that's going to happen right away. Uh, this, all these, these processes, the, the adoption of carrier ID, the uh, certification of operators, all of those things are going to take some time. But if we, we want to have a, a set policies for doing it, and we're working hard to get people who, uh, involved in that. If, if anybody has any ideas about this or wants to work with us, we're happy to, uh, we're up on the, we're to thank you and, and goodbye. Um, uh, we're happy to, uh, to, to, to do what we can to get more people involved in, in uh, one, uh, designing the goals of the of, of RFIEY as well as um, trying to make this work for your company and the kind of work you do. Uh, so it, I've taken too much time probably already. So, sorry. <laughs> So again, we, what we do is we just we cut the SSPI thing a little short, and you know you run up to. Uh, I like SSPI, but you can't. Wait, lose. Uh, got it. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so now this we're talking about. That's Mr. Talbot, who's on the board of SSPI. I am, but <laughs> <laughs> if not, he should. Is what you're saying? As <laughs> interesting as he is. Yes. Let's turn it over to. Uh, to Dave now. Here, we'll pass that on. Okay. Thank you. I'm Dave Chilson from CBS, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the issues in network design related to spectrum and efficiency. Right. When I first started in the satellite industry quite some years ago, right out of college, and you, you start learning the industry, there's a term, frequency reuse. So you study what that is, and it means, of course, the technical term is Polarization enables the doubling of uh, the spectrum. But now there's actually a more interesting use now. So others in the industry think frequency reuse means, can I use your frequency too, please? <laughs> <laughs> because as we know, there's the law of physics and there's only so many frequencies available and uh, other industries are eyeing the spectrum that broadcasters are using. In fact, there's a, a legacy there we already know that the two gigahertz broadcast auxiliary spectrum has uh, come and gone. Uh, you know, and there was a program to appease broadcasters to move uh, to frequencies, and so that was a lesson learned. And now there's another ongoing effort to take frequencies away on the UHF band and to uh, uh, take the upper 120 megahertz. But also not just on the ground, but there are issues with satellite spectrum and capacity as well. Uh, you know, when you think about when we started in this industry and there was originally four degree spacing, now two degree spacing, and you look at all the orbital assignments and you're saying, wow, we're actually getting to that point that we're just about running out of slots. And so when capacity is at its maximum and if demand keeps growing, eventually you'll get to that point where the cost benefit equation doesn't tip in your favor as a user, as a buyer. So. Demand, demand equation versus orbital slots is now reaching that point where there's a factor that transponder costs are now going to start incrementing. So there's a reason to try and use spectrum more efficiently. Just a point on this topic of the broadcasters using spectrum, there is a program out there to try and share the channels. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, I had a nice conversation with Jay just about this a little while ago that uh, there's the, the effort, we're not sure how well it will uh, proceed to uh, incite or invite broadcasters to give up channels in certain bands and repack the spectrum. Um, again, there's limitations involved. You know, that you still have ATSC requirements to be met. In MPEG-2, initially, is the uh, compression standard. There's always a possibility of perhaps going to other uh, MPEG-4 as an option. Uh, many television receivers today have that capability of decoding, but there's always a risk factor. A broadcaster doesn't want to make that leap until he's sure that it's not going to impact uh, the audience. 
Although when you consider the number of viewers that are watching over the air versus receiving cable, uh, it might be a worthwhile venture. Plus there's the issue of the uh, merging mobile business. ATSC Mobile is a very promising uh, development and if there's a repack or a reshuffling, we have to contend with how that is going to be impacted. Will there be space and bits available for that service? And the bottom line is there just might be limited solutions uh, for this event. And sort of as a broadcaster, we're kind of hoping that it would just go away. But we're going to go through the process and, and see where it winds up. Well, that's mostly on the terrestrial side. But back on the satellite issue, of course, we still have the fact that uh, we're going to have a uh, demand issue with satellite capacity. CBS at the current time, we have 10 transponders on a full-time lease. And, of course, we bought the 10 and during the transitional time where we knew we had a lot of SD and HD running in parallel. Now we're HD only, and we say, well, we can throttle back a little bit. But when we look at how much we can throttle back, it's a question of what technology can we use and how much are we going to have to pay for these transponders now compared to 10 or 12 years ago. So what are the solutions in this issue of less capacity and more cost. Well, one is possibly fiber optics. As a broadcast, national broadcast network, we're at that point again when we re-sign for capacity that we go to the national carriers, and we've asked the three major national carriers to price out a completely uh, domestic terrestrial fiber network to take signals from New York and LA and go to all 220 CBS affiliates. And the result is that the national part of it, getting to all the pops, is a reasonable venture, but the local loop cost is still a little bit out of touch. I mean, you imagine, yes, in the major cities, but try get a local loop in Yakima, Washington. You know, there is no such thing as a local loop in Yakima, Washington. You have to feed them from Seattle. So with that cost equation, it still can't compete with just the pure efficiency of satellite. So you're stuck with satellite, which has been a good benefactor for the broadcast industry since the mid-'80s. And what are the techniques? Well, one, of course, is to upgrade your modulation to a more complex, more dense format with uh, better coding gain, but I'm not going to get into those details. I'll leave that for Slava here shortly in uh, his discussion. What I'm going to just briefly touch upon, of course, is compression technology. Even though most of us are students of the industry and uh, understand it well, let's just put it up on the board and, and see what, what's happening. Well, we're not going to talk too much about MPEG-2, even though there has been you know, it's a continual evolutionary improvement in MPEG-2, because as you get better processors, you can do some things in that vintage game. But MPEG-4, H.264, is what we're currently looking at uh, migrating to in just about all facets of our business. CBS, as an example, is a bit of a laggard in that we made an investment in MPEG-2 some six or seven years ago, and we're just now feeling the payout. So MPEG-4 has been there all this time. It's been out all the way since 2003. One might say it's almost a vintage compression format. But when it was released, it was, it was almost more a promise than a uh, reality at the time because the algorithms required certain more processing power. Now you go five, six, seven years and the processing power is caught up and MPEG-4 is living up to its true vision, both for broadcasters and folks in the internet space as well. Of course, it immediately got adopted in areas such as Blu-ray and direct-to-home because there was a cry for it at that point when it first got released. But for broadcast distribution, the networks made the migration slowly. We're just looking at making that migration next year. Finally, MPEG-4 has come at with higher levels. One of the issues was uh, contribution quality. You didn't have 422. You didn't have 10-bit coding possible. Now these things are happening in the MPEG-4 space, so there's a lot of promise there. But there are always issues, interoperability among them. We're certainly glad that there have been some organizations involved in making sure that codecs and decodecs of different manufacturers you know, speak to each other. Uh, one thing about MPEG-4 is certainly when you look at this of profiles and levels, it, certainly it's a lot of profiles and a lot of levels. It's a very complex format, more than MPEG-2 ever was. Uh, and then the issue of picture quality. We think it's finally at this point, uh, there's a maturity and that the, like I said, the promise is, is there that we're getting a picture quality that at the reduction in data rate, we're maintaining quality. And people tend to ask me, it says, well, how do you decide as a broadcaster what bit rate you're going to run MPEG-4 at? Is it purely a subjective or is there some objective measure? And it's almost a, sort of a dartboard on the wall. You say, well, with, if we're doing 40 megabit today, we'll cut it in half and try 20 megabit, you know, plus or minus a few megabits. So it, it almost tends to say what fits in the channel, and is it a reasonable number? And you run your test in the lab, you say, that's what's going to be acceptable. It's almost a very uh, non-technical methodology of a choosing what that data rate is going to be. As an example today, we find that in a 36 megahertz transponder with the equipment that was available, we can only fit 80 megabits in a particular transponder. 
Well, we knew we went to a higher modulation format, 80 megabits. We wanted to do more than one program service. So you cut it in two and say 40. Well, and you hope 40 works. So now we're still going to use 80, and they say, well, what's MPEG-4 going to be? Do we split it into three? 320s, 340s, you know, and so it's, uh, it's a gambit to play, but it all comes to what fits. So when you're talking about maximizing your spectrum efficiency, you look at what your channel is, and then perhaps sometimes you make compromises. Hopefully not, because MPEG-4 has really come along and uh, fit the bill. And I'm going to skip over a few of these items here because we're short on time, just moving on to the next item, which we call the next big thing, which of course is uh, 265 the emerging standard, the next level. And here we're at a conundrum at CBS because we want to make the change now because we're at a point in the transponder change uh, that we want to renegotiate for space. But here's a compression standard that has a lot of promise but yet isn't available to us. So do we wait and try and stretch MPEG-2 and make the leap to the next? But as you know, there are issues with this standard as well. It's been a long time in the making. There's, we understand product in the lab that looks and works very good, and we've had some sneak peeks at it. Uh, but uh, there's no interlace format yet. That was mentioned earlier, and certainly broadcasters like CBS deal in interlace, and a lot of our cable networks work in interlace, so we're at a conundrum now of how do we convince the powers to be to bring this technology with all of its power into the broadcast realm. So we're hoping that at some point that happens. And the answer is? And the answer is we're going to wait for it. <laughs> we'll wait and see. In any event, that's just the issues that, you know, we know that we want to reduce the number of transponders that we use because they're getting expensive because of the demands and supply equation. Uh, and we are looking at what the technology is to help that. And MPEG-4 looks like it's in the sweet spot, finally, with the contribution level performance that a network like CBS would need. So that's my point. And I'll turn it over to Slava. Thank you, <clears throat> Two presentations leading into mine. Because, you know, I represent Newtech and we look at the world from the technology standpoint. So I guess we're the ones who have to have answers, right? We're the ones who you look at for putting this into this. We can't help you with paying nothing for it. But we certainly be able to, you know, show some uh, improvements that we're able to do um, in the last few years and this year in particular to help to reduce the burden of uh, uh, high cost of uh, satellite capacity. So what we've seen also and has been discussed that broadcast industries has been undergoing some changes and we talked about convergence to IP and um, the challenge of delivering content over multiple platforms that all creates complexity. But what, you know, one thing that remains constant is that satellite capacity is very premium um, element and it's essential element in uh, delivery of um, video to the consumers. So for us uh, the main challenge is how do you make the use of that bandwidth most efficiently and uh, uh, make sure that you can get maximum uh, out of the existing um, uh, bandwidth that you have or maybe potentially reducing that. Uh, which means we have to constantly come up with innovations and I can tell you it's not easy. It's not easy to constantly innovate, but we have a track record and we've done this over and over again. And what helps us is that um, we're able to do that on multiple layers, physical layer, IP layer, because systems are becoming more um, complex and uh, more, more uh, multi-layers. So in um, speaking of um, uh, solutions, and it's never one thing, because depending on the application, <laughs> you can use one or multiple technologies to, to, to achieve the result. But speaking about continuous innovation, uh, we don't always, let's say, sometimes we don't even know how much we're able to achieve because there's a lot of smart heads in the company until we actually start doing that. And then you get things like this, for example. And this was one of the latest press releases that we put up, you know, 506 megabits uh, over the 72 megahertz transponder sounds unheard of but this is the real stuff. Um, but again, it's a technology enable. We put this in the hands of broadcasters and satellite operators, and it's up to them to make the best use out of that. So let's maybe look at a few things that uh, um, we're, 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 um, we have in the works. And I think this one is worth spending some time on it because there was a lot of discussion this year specifically. There was a lot of talks in, in the industry about uh, DVBS2 and there were some other numbers we're throwing out. Um, well, this is the, 
you know, di diagram with um, a few points, and uh, you could see <clears throat> most of you are familiar with DVBS, and uh, you know that many years ago, majority of broadcast systems were utilizing DVBS, uh, you know, very effectively. Then DVBS 2 came along in 2005, and overnight delivered substantial efficiency to a number of uh, applications, mainly to distribution application. DTH, direct to home, greatly benefited from it. And, and any any distribution uh, um, applications, basically overnight delivering 40, 50 megabits. So what we started seeing now that DVBS2 was used not only in broadcast uh, applications, but also for data transmission. And we start seeing more and more then when it comes to point to point, on point to limited multi-point <coughs> applications, applications that can tolerate uh, a higher carry to noise ratio. Uh, the systems are running at maximum performance. So we see a lot of trunking platforms in, in, in let's say, outside of the U.S., um, in Africa, running, you know, highest order modulation. And we also see some video backhaul applications that also running at the maximum efficiency. So if you look at that and if you compare to this to the famous Shannon limit, you see that there is a still improvement that can be made. So what happened early this year, uh, in February, in fact, uh, new tech, uh, together with a group of companies, made a suggestion to made a proposal to DVB to uh, improve DVB uh, as two standard, and there was a number of, of recommendations made. One of them is to increase the number of um, um, well, add different modulation and and, and increase the number of uh, uh, mod cuts. So effectively, in DVBS2, you have 26 combinations. Our proposal was to move beyond that and uh, add up to 104. There were also additional recommendations made. And if anybody knows how DVB works, you can't just make those suggestions alone. You have to have a coalition of companies, and we had backing of a number of satellite operators and system houses. So why did we do that? I mean, why are we going for standardization? Why can't we be like the other guys? They said, hey, here's the block, block box, just don't ask me what's inside. The short answer to that, because we care. Because we care about the industry. And we know what standards do uh, to the industry. They create economy of scale. And then they make sure that there are products available at reasonable cost. Because in broadcast applications, there's one box that it's transmitting, but it's typically many other boxes and there are multiple uh, hardware solutions that receiving that. So you can't just have it all in one. Uh, it just doesn't work. So for us, this was a big, big step forward. And um, what we now expect that by uh, March of next year, DVB will come up with intermediate standard, which again will be published and, and uh, adopted by by the industry. Again, the reason we do that is it's an open standard. It's available to everyone. So anybody who is interested in building solutions and building devices will be able to do that. And we at Newtech have always believed in open standards, and uh, we've proven that over and over that you can be the best within the standard. So this is the one thing that um, you know you should expect, and and that's one thing that uh, that will be coming later this year, uh, actually early next year. Um, now, here's another thing that was done also to better utilize existing space segment. Uh, we call it clean channel technology. And what it is, it's the improved filtering on the modulation that um, where you can select smaller roll-off. I mean, today in DVB-S2, you have 35, 25, and 20%. So what we're proposing uh, is 15, 10, and 5%. So you have a steeper slope. You can put uh, more mega symbols in your existing bandwidth, whether it's 36 or 54 or 72 megahertz, and utilize it more efficiently. So you may ask, why do you need 10, 15, and 5 if you can go with 5? So there are a number of applications where actually 10 and 5 work better. The beauty of this is this is a software upgrade to the existing modulation and it works with existing receivers in the field. So the broadcasters, again, speaking about being, caring about the industry, reducing the, ban, uh, the, reducing the burden of upgrading your existing infrastructure, this is what we had in mind. Uh, again, the efficiency that we see is between 5 and 15 percent, which is in most cases is, is, is big. 
Um, no, we touched upon um, uh, delivery or, or, um, or applications where you deliver uh, video content to a large number of, uh, of, of remotes, and DTH is one example of that. Um, typically, when you have an application like this, you're dealing with inexpensive set-top boxes. So what you can, if, if you run out of capacity, if, you, if you're limited by what you have, there's very not much you can do. Uh, you, and these are the devices that typically do not support exotic modulation scheme, and I call exotic uh, 16 APSK and 32 APSK. So you're limited to what, what you have, and the only thing you can do is do something in the uplink. So Equalink is, is one of the products that, uh, that was developed a number of years ago, and it's uh, developed specifically to address DTH market or uh, distribution market. Um, basically, it's a pre-correction uh, that deals with uh, nonlinearity in satellite transponder and deals with uh, group delay and nonlinear predistortion. Uh, by measuring, and you have a, a demodulator device in the uplink, you can do the sweep, you can measure your um, um, RF uh, transmit chain, and you can measure the, uh, the transponder characteristics. By doing that, you can find the optimal point, and, and you can actually increase the throughput uh, of or add a number, uh, a number of channels uh, to the existing bouquet. So what we've seen to the, uh, with the platforms that have been deployed and being improved, uh, that you can achieve up to 10, 11%. Again, speaking of efficiency, this is one of the, one of the um, um, tools in our toolbox that, that can be used depending on what the application is. And of course, nobody can talk about efficient use of satellite spa uh, space segment without touching uh, the issue of carrier ID. This, is, um, this has been an issue for a number of years for the industry. It's an issue for broadcasters. They've been, their transmission being interrupted. Uh, uh, they've been knocked off the air. It's also a hidden cost for satellite operators because they have to maintain staff. They have to identify who's transmitting. They have to, they have to do a lot of manual work uh, in order to prevent this. They have to reserve capacity. So this has been a, a big issue for, for the industry. And, uh, very glad that Newtek uh, this year has taken a very active role working with uh, Dick and, and a number of uh, industry groups to counter the interference. Of course, there are solutions for that. I mean, investing in better training is certainly one of them, and, and Dick covered that uh, a little bit. But what we see also is that uh, funds that are available to train uh, personnel is is has been reduced. So, and a lot of companies are struggling. So this is, this is not something that uh, companies uh, can e invest easily. So one of the solutions is, um, um, is to have a carrier ID. And um, in, um, there is a current version that exists today, uh, and that's NIT. Um, and uh, this is intermediate before the standardized version uh, will be released by DVB. Again, Speaking of uh, standardization and standard solutions, this is something that we'll be able to uh, incorporate, will be, able, will be incorporated in, in a number of devices for those who, who are interested. So what it is, is neat version uh, is currently available on our new modulation platform. What it is, it's the information that's embedded in the transfer stream, and it has the uh, modulator vendor, has serial number, but it also has the uh, GPS coordinates and information like phone number, uh, company name, and, 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 and address. So uh, uh, a satellite operator can easily contact a person and, and uh, uh, deal with the um, unexpected or, or um, unintended um, interference. Because again, statistic is that over 90% of interference is unintentional. So somebody forgot to switch something off or somebody's transmitting, switch something, on. switch something on, exactly. Somebody's transmitting when it shouldn't be transmitting. And, and I think the information like serial numbers and, and, and manufacturer will help greatly because we've heard the stories that even when the satellite operator identify <coughs> the company and make the call, they still said, no, 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 it's not us. It's not our device. No, because they have huge facilities. They cannot possibly control every single device in that facility. Um, so identifying the specific serial number, specific device that is transmitting is, is I think, essential. 
And um, our M6100, uh, uh, it's you know the new platform, to the best of my knowledge, is the first modulator uh, that exists today that supports NIT. Because again, you can participate in, in many panels and you can talk about, but I think I always say actions speak louder than words. So if you, you have to put something in action, you have to, you have to show with real things that you support the initiative. And of course, the proposal that is currently um, looked upon and evaluated by DVB is the uh, RF version. And um, we had um, a DVB representative at our panel at NAB who openly confirmed that the standardized solution will be available before end of the year. And Maybe just uh, yeah. the thing about that, once that's confirmed by DVB form, yeah. there is also the idea of then taking that and, and submitting it as a recommendation to the ID, ITU and having them uh, issue it yeah. also as a standard. So, so the, uh, we want to push this forward. Uh, and plus, it's like in the U.S., I know the FCC is uh, recently, uh, there was a statement about they're wanting to find ways to better improve the use of spectrum. And, and uh, things like this are going to be the kinds of things that will help make that possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we're, uh, we're happy to take part of that and, and lead the effort. And uh, we're looking forward to having a standardized solution that will benefit the industry. That's basically it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen.